Dzień dobry Państwu. Uh, let's, let's, let's start. We have with us Ivan Krastyev, as you know, not for the first time, not for the last time, I, I hope. <laughs> mm, uh, he had an overburdened schedule for today, so we will finish exactly at, at five o'clock. Uh, the subject we, we propose, he, he will talk in, in Gazeta with some others, with Klaus beside others, uh, about Europe in Gazeta Wyborcza. Um, I thought that the subject, which is very interesting, which also uh, belongs to the competence of, uh, of Ivan, he is very well known for his analysis of international relations also about U.S. policy and a lot about, he wrote about, about Russia policy. So I thought that overview in the situation of fundamental uncertainty concerning American policy to talk about, about U.S. policy centering on European Union and Russia can be of interest. Uh, Ivan added Turkey. He visited recently, and this is uh, Turkey is uh, one of the subjects of his interest. But of course, our discussion will be not limited to 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 uh, to, to, to to those uh, to those uh, subjects. Uh, um, I, I, I would like to to start with one with one with one question, one, one remark, which is a question in the same time. On the very beginning. Uh, even before elections or immediately after uh, after election, the impression one had, and it was quite widespread, that uh, that uh, task is of course very much pro russians I thought that this is for geopolitical reasons a little bit connected with the model of the world of the Cold War period, to have sort of alliance. Uh, uh, with Russians to limit economic influence. Economy seems to be the most important factor of, of the China and to have allies against Muslim wars. They are using the word just Muslims, not, not radical Muslims with Huntingtonians, uh, with Huntingtonian uh, vision. Afterwards, it became clear that one of his uh, um, uh, subject of his attacks was European Union and, and Germany, and certainly not only for economic reasons, NATO and, and so on. Uh, so the, the problem is to what extent uh, uh, you can still see those uh, simply presented uh, lines in uh, U.S. Uh, policy because uh, people are talking rather about transformation under the influence of generals who, so, uh, who are surrounding him and who are competent in, fo in foreign and foreign policy. To what extent we can see, uh, and to what extent it is serious the, the transformation of of priorities. What can we expect uh, both as concern Russia and and, uh, and, uh, and European Union and other regions of the world. Thank you very much, and I, I will pass to, to Ivan. He, will, he wants to, to talk shortly and rather to discuss with us afterwards. So Ivan, the floor is here. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, and I'll really try to use it as an opportunity, because uh, I had the feeling that I have much more questions than uh, answers, and I'll try to uh, to give my reading, I was several times in the U.S. after uh, uh, Trump was elected, and I was in Russia several times after Trump was elected. Uh, and then I'm going to share you how, the, after different visits, basically the perception has been changing. But there is one book which I'm strongly recommending for everybody who tries to make his own view on Trump outside of now everybody tries to tell us what Trump is about. Uh, this is a book written by two persons. One of them is a very famous Cambridge historian, Bernard Sims. And he did something which is so simple that any of us could, could have done it. He took all the interviews that Trump has given from 1980 to 2012, which was before he entered the crisis. Only interviews. He was not interested in the books because he said the books were written by other people. Uh, he took all the interviews. I mean, the interviews in a mainstream media, but also Playboy interviews and others. And the only questions that he was asking was, is there a certain type of a core values and positions that has not changed? To what extent Trump has, and we're talking not so much about ideology, but kind of a 
what are the pillars of his view of the world. And I found this book very helpful because uh, according to the book, there are three things that are critically important. In 1980s, he started to be interested in politics and obviously started probably to consider that one day it's not going to be bad somebody like him to run the country. Uh, from the very first moment, he had a very strong view on the trade. Free trade, he never believes it's a win-win game. He always believes that it's a zero-sum game, and he never could understand how the America created a system in which the border between victory and defeat is totally blurred. And this is important. For him, the idea of victory is quite important, and to be victorious means to be very, in order for you to be victorious, somebody else should be defeated. Here comes an interesting story about Russia. Already in the 1980s, he said, it's strange, the World War II, was won by us, by Brits, and by the Soviets. And who are the biggest beneficiaries? The Germans and the Japanese. What kind of victory is this? And the idea of a victory for him is a critical, uh, critical concept. 1980 was also the moment in which uh, uh, the Iranian Revolution, 1979, came, and the American power was very much humiliated there. So of all these years, you have an obsession with Iran and the Islam, which goes much more before 9-11. For example, you're going to see in a Playboy interview out of nowhere, he's going to say, and we allowed the Iranians to humiliate us. Uh, and the third thing that is also, in my view, quite interesting, and from this point of view, I do believe, uh, because I'm trying to take Trump slightly more serious, but not in his personal capacity, but if expressing certain type of a new mood, uh, particularly on the side of part of the American public. And this new understanding of the American public is that after all these years, in which everybody was claiming that the American is the biggest victory of the Cold War, of globalizations and others, so now come Trump and said, we are not the winners, we are the losers. And people said, he's right. He's right because our system is looked dysfunctional. He's right because our society looks cohesion. And here comes the idea, because also nobody respects us. The term respect, Trump is using very much in the way President Putin is using it. For example, the fact that Germany has such a big surplus is a show of disrespect. Uh, because he said, we are protecting them. We're guaranteeing their security, and this is simply disrespect for them to have this type of a surplus when we have this deficit. Uh, at least I do believe, and there are people here who know Russia much better than me, but if you talk to the Russians seriously about what is so worrying, uh, uh, according to them, with the NATO uh, enlargement, they're going to say, yes, you're right, we're nuclear power, we can defend ourselves. But the expansion of NATO was a major expression of disrespect for Russia. And this idea of what it means to be respected, and I find this quite important because to be respected means in any type of a relationship to acknowledge the power asymmetry. What he hates about the liberal order is this hypocrisy that everybody looks and pretends to be equal in a world in which they are not. So he said this is totally hypocritical, Bulgaria to pretend, which is true. The same influence as the United States. This world, based on this hypocrisy, does not work. It should be clear where the power stands. And for the United States, being the strongest country in the world, it cannot be in the American interest this type of basically covering these power asymmetries. So this is why for him the European Union, in the beginning it was a very strong uh, claim because he said, where is the interest of the United States to negotiate with the European Union, such a big market? If we have a bilateral trade negotiations with the member states, we're going to have a better deals. Why America allowed a system in which we negotiate in a, in a way that is hurting us? And because if you believe that it is a zero-sum game, the trade, uh, it starts to make sense. So from this point of view, unlike people, uh, and he bought for a while uh, the Bennett's idea that there is an anti-globalization global revolution going on. And this is a history. It cannot be turned. So better jump on the historical trend uh, than 
kind of defend the status quo, uh, because uh, I can imagine basically telling him, do you want to be Hillary Clinton to defend something that is going to uh, go down anyway? I do believe here people, uh, and he didn't think in European security terms, what the generals changed probably was basically putting the security dimension and saying, listen, probably in trade terms, Europe, which is divided, is easier for us. In security terms, it is not. Uh, but what has changed, and I do believe it is serious, is that preserving European Union is not going to be the major objective of the American foreign policy. I don't believe that he will be interested to destroy the European Union, probably some more radical people in the administration. I don't believe the president. And here goes the relations with Russia. Uh, let's see what is going to come out of this investigation. Personally, and I have talked to a lot of people, I'll be surprised if there are going to be any proof for personal contacts between Donald Trump and the senior Russian officials related to the campaign. Because the, what the Russians did was much more about Clinton than about Trump. As I said, you have a former ambassador here who has been spending much more time in Moscow. There was an obsession on the Russians' high political circles that if Hillary is going to be elected, this is going to lead to the military clashes between the Russians and the Americans in Syria and even in Ukraine, I mean limited. The obsession with Hillary Clinton was incredible. So the idea to hurt Hillary, which uh, Putin believed that she was personally responsible for the protest in 2011, 2012, and he believes it. It's not that he's saying this, he believes it. Uh, it became very personal. So from this point of view, I'm sure that they were ready to hack uh, Hillary Clinton emails, nevertheless, who was going to be the candidate of the Republican Party. And of course, uh, because of the nature of Trump, because of different business people, he's been working with him over the years, there was an idea that they can make a deal with him. Uh, when I was after the elections immediately in Moscow, there was a celebration, incredible. Uh, this was, but, but it was, uh, they really, uh, also they bought the narrative coming from New York Times and others that they won the elections, that this hacking was critically important and so on and so on. So there was a level of uh, celebration which created an expectations that Russian-American relations are going to change very radically, that as a result of it, Russia does not need to have any special policy with respect to the European Union because the change of the Russian-American relations is going to change the position of the European Union totally. There was no need to talk neither to the French nor to the Germans because everything is going to change. Of course, it didn't work exactly as they imagined. And then uh, I do believe uh, when I was there at the end of the year already, the Russians has recognized four things. First, because of the high level of politicization of the Russia issue in the American policy, he can do nothing with respect to Russia. I don't know what he wants, what he believes. I'll be surprised. Not He cannot neither cooperate nor doing anything because in certain way, they're not going to be a Russia policy. Everything where the word Russia is going to be mentioned is going to be American domestic politics. And for the Democrats, Russia is the way to try to impeach him. And for some of the Republicans, this is the way to try to discipline him. Uh, but as a result of it, he has a zero room for maneuvering when it comes to Russia. Uh, the second thing which Russians started to realize, and this was uh, quite interesting, was with Trump elected, Russia lost monopoly over unpredictability. One of the major assets of the Russian foreign policy was a very controlled and instrumentalized unpredictability, people waking up and asking what President Putin will do. Now people are waking up and asking what President Trump will do. And for Russia, which was playing from the position of structural weakness, uh, monopoly over unpredictability was a very important asset. The third thing that happened, and I do believe it was interesting, nevertheless, that, uh, and they managed to deal with this, after Trump's victory and these three months in which there was a huge Russia celebrations, just to give you one uh, fact, in January this year, Trump's name was mentioned in the Russian media more often than the name of President Putin. This has not happened to anybody. 
ever. Uh, there was a special uh, meeting uh, in which Kremlin basically asked uh, the, the, the media uh, to reduce uh, the coverage and also to change the tone. Uh, but the biggest problem came that some of the Russian uh, nationalistic circles bought the idea of the anti-globalization revolution and nevertheless <laughs> these people Mr. Dugin including, are not critical to President Putin personally, they started to use the idea of the Trump's coming and the idea of a new a strategic alliance and a new revolution as the way to attack some people very close to President Putin. So-called the Atlantic entourage, the globalist entourage. Even there was a very interesting uh, thesis being discussed in, the, uh, in this circle saying, now the China is going to be the globalists and you're going to see how these people that have been pro-American until yesterday now are going to become pro-Chinese because at the end of the day they're globalists and there was of course attack on Kudrin, but on many people including Sachin. Uh, so this has also created uh, a fear and there was a, a, a report that was prepared by a new think tank which was created by Kirienko uh, some months ago after he came to Kremlin on uh, popu technological populism in which the major argument is that the populist wave that we're observing now in the US and uh, Western Europe is going to hit Russia during the next electoral cycle. So from this point of view, the disruption that Trump put in the system started to be feared. And the fourth thing that happened, and I find this, and this is just uh, uh, last but one, uh, from the, uh, Trump's coming to power totally changed the communication channels between Russia and the United States. If you go to Moscow these days, and if you decide to stay in a very expensive hotel, you're going to see at least three American business people who claim that they know very well Trump. They're playing golf with him, and they're there to help for the Russian-American relations, and they're asking for meetings and so on. Uh, because of business interests, mostly of them, but as a result of it, the major communication channel, which was on the government level, so you have a lot of freelancing middlemen, which creates incredible noise in the system. And I do believe that for people like McMaster and others, this is just a nightmare. Of course, uh, Trump does not have any idea why these people are there, what they're doing, uh, but on the other side, the Russians are trying to guess. Probably some of these people really has an access. Probably some of this person really can have an impact. Uh, so this type of a total change in the communication system, uh, and you really don't know who speaks on behalf of whom and how important is this channel, in my view, is becoming critically important. Uh, one of the, in my view, negative effect of this total focusing on the Trump-Russia relations for the American foreign policy is that as a result of it, China, which I find is a much more strategic challenge on the order level for the United States, has been marginalized. Uh, and by the way, just to give you one example, when some people say that he's going to have a pro-Russia policy, either because of the way he thinks about foreign policy or because of other things, but Trump did something. If you want to hurt the Russians, you should do one thing. Basically, you should try to reduce the price of oil. This is exactly what he did with fracking. The moment you cannot have a really strategic pro-Russia policy if you're going to allow fracking because it immediately had an impact on the price of oil, which for Russia is the major source of political stability. I don't believe that he did it as anti-Russia policy, simply in his head. The fracking and Russia does not stay in the same box. And this is part of the thing which uh, uh, Moa's point is one is on Europe, uh, and I don't believe that Europe has a policy with respect to the United States and how to deal with uh, uh, Trump. Different countries decided to do it on their own. On one side was the countries which decided to take a very early risk uh, and to basically bet on Trump with the idea that if he's going to be elected, they're going to have a major advantage, and this country was hungry. Uh, Prime Minister Orban was the first one, very early on, by the way, in June openly backing President Trump, uh, very much believing that he can be the third man in this type of a Trump-Putin relationship, but also uh, from his point of view, uh, this made a lot of sense because he knew that Soros has a, uh, one of the major donors to the Hillary campaign, so he has nothing to lose, by the way, uh, backing, uh, backing Trump. 
It didn't work as he expected for the simple reason that I cannot imagine under what condition Trump is going to end up being interested in Hungary as a special issue. So he never managed to get up to the, uh, then, uh, the General McMaster. And for General McMaster, the fact that somebody wants to close American University in Budapest means what about America first? Uh, so from this point of view, I do believe uh, part of the problem with the strategy of the strong, uh, small countries with respect to Trump is they didn't realize how difficult it is to go to the top of the president's agenda simply. Germany was the biggest loser of this development, uh, and my feeling is that they made a decision that uh, Ivanka Trump is the best way for them to deal with the administration for three reasons. One is because uh, on things that are quite important for them, like climate change, but also trade and so on, she had a much more moderate position. But as one of the ministers told me, she's the only one that could not be fired. And, and no, no, but this is, uh, uh, don't underestimate the profoundness of the statement. Because there is so much factional competitions that if you basically bet on the wrong faction, you can lose a lot. And from this point of view, she could not be fired. <laughs> uh, and then I will go to the last point of mine, which uh, is uh, uh, related in a way uh, to, uh, uh, to Trump and to all this, but it's very marginal. But I try to put it because uh, everybody has his obsession. I was in Turkey. It's not going to be about Turkey. This is just for. Uh, for uh, for this public that uh, most easily than others is going to uh, uh, to estimate at least my impression of what I saw. We have been with Carl Bildt through the ECFR just a month after the coup, and we had a meeting with uh, the, the President Erdogan, and he was talking about Gulen, he was talking around one hour. I do believe that in three minutes we also made a comment. Uh, and I looked all the time the way he talked, and I had the feeling that I have read this somewhere. For the first time in my life, I know how the relations between Stalin and Trotsky were. He believed that the world outside of Turkey is controlled by Gulen. There was the map of the world. And he said that the major objective of the Turkish foreign policy is going to be to dismantle the Gulen's global network. Gulen's global network includes everything from a Gulen-founded school in Africa to anybody who attended a conference. And the funny story is that most of this conference of the Gulenists have been paid by the Turkish government when they have been in a coalition. Uh, but this is such a strong uh, fixation on Gulen that I do believe this is one thing that we should always keep in mind when we try to understand what is happening because from our analysis, you go with something which is more real. Nothing is more real uh, for Mr. Erdogan these days than Gulen. And I'm saying this because I was in the Balkans. Again, we built, we went to Macedonia, we went to Serbia, we talked to everybody there. Uh, and here is my feeling. If there is a place in Europe, if the tensions between Russia and European Union are going to increase the place where, in my view, has the highest risk for destabilization is not the Baltics. Baltics is a high-risk zone. NATO has been too much concentrating there. It is the Balkans. And here is my logic, and I just really want to see what is also your intuition and view of this. First, Russia goes into election year. In the election year, President Putin is not going to do anything that basically can produce a major source of instability. Uh, because nevertheless, if he wants to disrupt outside, basically this disruption should not go back. And this is a serious election. I know that people don't take Russian elections very seriously, but in fact, it's not the case. Uh, uh, President Putin has asked his administration three things, and they're not easy. He wants a higher turnout than on the previous elections. He had a higher result, and he wanted it as clean as possible. So we're not talking about staffing the ballots, because it's very much a legacy election for him. In order to have it, you're not going to tolerate a major type of a disruption. On the other side, the Balkans are very much destabilized, not to blame the Russians for this, and we see very much politicization of ethnic and religious uh, 
identities. Any one of you who is interested, there is also great data about Poland, by the way. There was a new uh, big survey which was published last week uh, by Pew Research on the national and religious identities. And you're going to see quite interesting. Of course, the Catholic countries more religious than the others, but you have a decline of religiosity. And basically what's happening in Poland and Hungary is not very different than what happened in Western Europe, for example, 30 years ago. In Eastern Europe, uh, post-Soviet, but also Bulgaria, Romania, Greece, Serbia, uh, the level of religiosity is very low. 5% of the Bulgarians ever go to church, but very strong identification with the Orthodox Church uh, because it's uh, perceived as the major part of our national identity. Russia is perceived as the counterpoint and defendant of this uh, Orthodox culture against the West, and the West is perceived as kind of outside of it. In places like Macedonia, like Serbia and others, you can touch on it. And why I do believe that European Union is in a very tricky position in the Balkans. When the conflict goes between the politicized Orthodox Christianity on one side, and on the other, a very much politicized Islam supported both Turkey in places like uh, uh, Macedonia and Saudis in places like Bosnia, European Union cannot enter. It, sound, it looks as a kind of a third party, which is above the frame, but it does not have a constituency of its own. And the Russians played the Macedonian crisis incredibly well. They don't have any special interest in Macedonia. They don't have a business. It's not Bulgaria, even there was not a network. But the Russian foreign ministry uh, was making every week a very strong declaration concerning taking the side of the Gruevsky government, talking about sovereignty, and talking the fact that European Union is a colonizing power in the Balkans. So there is a very strong attempt, particularly the orthodox nationalism, to be shaped into the anti-EU one. And because now the perspective of joining the European Union is very far away from some of these countries, the migration crisis produced a major shock. There is a major demographic fear that it's a very small nations. Uh, I do believe this is one part of Europe in which everybody knows that there is a problem. Nobody has a patience to look at. And this is, and this is my last point, this is a place in which the United States will not come back. Neither for geopolitical reasons, it makes sense for them to go back. Mr. Trump will not go to defend Albanians, which was the role of the United States during the Bosnian. Plus, for him, it's a Clinton land. It was a Clinton wall in Kosovo. You have this big Bill Clinton Boulevard. So he would not go to send troops basically to march on the Clinton Boulevard. So from this point of view, I do believe that from this point of view, how we are going to refocus uh, on the Balkans and what kind of an effective policy should be is becoming a key question. And the story is that none of the nation states can really pay enough attention on this. Germany is all over the place with Ukraine and others. France is very much about Africa and Europe. Uh, Poland, I even don't believe that you are very much following what is going on there anyway. So I'll stop here. Thank you, Ivan, very much. Please, the floor is yours. We, we have one hour and 20 minutes. Yes. Yes, you too. Yes, start. Please present yourself because this is unregistered. So, oh, is uh, Łukasz Pawłowski, Kultura Liberalna. Mm. So, uh, I wanted to ask uh, even about, you said uh, that uh, Hungary or any other small na nation cannot get to the top of president's agenda. And my question is basically, is there a president's agenda? Uh, in the sense uh, that uh, you mentioned all of those three points that seem to be important to him over the years. But if you look at those couple of months, and it's been only four months, can you really see any, any agenda, or is it more like a crisis management, constant crisis management, and is going to get only worse after the prosecution uh, starts to start to operate? Uh, that's uh, that's the major point. Uh, it, can you really analyze? Because you can actually 
the, the, when you mentioned the book, this might be a, an interesting intellectual endeavor to, to find some stable points in Trump's thinking. But from, from the idea to practice, there is a long way. And Trump's to, uh, Trump uh, seems to be very much influenced by, by any recent event that happens. Like the way he talked about North Korea after he, he had a discussion with Xi Jinping. He is basically influenced by the, by the last person he talked to. So this makes uh, any analysis quite, uh, quite difficult. And now on top of that, we have this major crisis which I think, I, I might disagree with you, I think it's very serious. And it's not about his links to, to Russians, but the fact that he might obstruct the, the process of, of unveiling those, those links or lack of thereof. And the second question is, uh, you said uh, that the Russians were primarily interested in, in not getting Hillary elected, not in getting Trump elected. So does it mean they, are, uh, they would be willing to let him go? Because what, what struck me is, uh, is, uh, is how hmm, laid back uh, they are about the current crisis. They even, you can, you, they are ironic about it. They, they make this uh, you know, ridiculous proposition of, of revealing transcripts, helping the American, uh, the Federal uh, Bureau of Investigation in investigating the, the, the links. So they are making it obvious, and that was also the point with Lavrov uh, during his visit in Washington. They're making fun of them. Uh, and not really hiding that. So uh, that, that's my question. That, that, that would be, that's something I don't understand. If you put a lot of effort in getting somebody elected, why would you dispose of him so easily? So um, that, that, that's something I, I, I don't understand. Uh, the, my major story is that they didn't really did so much to elect him. So from this point of view, distancing from him is much more important. Weakening and disrupting American political process was much more important for them mm -hmm. than Trump's elections. Uh, and secondly, I do believe that they despise him. Uh, because uh, he's a child, and on the other side there is an officer. And they don't go. Nevertheless, that on many things they can sound very similar. Uh, what Trump does not have, and which I do believe is the major problem for people like Putin, is total level of self-control. And also, when somebody have, does not have a self-control, nobody from outside can control him. You need self-control in order to be controllable. Uh, so, but uh, on your two, I very much agree with your idea that it's not going to be a grand strategy. It's not going to be a classical agenda, which does not mean that they're not going to be decision taken. Uh, what I'm afraid is the following, uh, because the only moment in which Trump get his approval rating going up was uh, after he fired missiles on Syria. Any president in trouble discovers that foreign policy is the best thing that you can do, particularly with this difficult situation. So we can end up in trying to see Trump, which is becoming much more activist, and it can have a very... Uh, no, but it can be, uh, he can do things that we don't expect him to do because also surprising others is the way he works. On the impeachment story, I agree that this could be a big problem, but for the moment, he had the support of more than 80% of the Republican voters. With such type of support, impeachment is a highly risky exercise. And also think about the American political system. Impeaching somebody so early in the process, uh, this is not something that is going to be easy. There are some senators, particularly senators, who are not going to run for uh, re-elections, like Senator McCain and others, who probably want to see him out during their terms. Uh, but on the other side, it's a very highly risk exercise. And legally, it's not so easy as it looks. Because I do believe we're going to see a lot of ambiguity because the way he talks, the way he speaks, and so on. But of course, he's going to be president under pressure. He's going to have a very <coughs> few moments to go. And this is one argument which I didn't make. But what strikes me, if you see his cabinet, and I'm saying also people that most of us like, if this was going to happen in Russia, we're going to call it the rise of Siloviki. It's not simply that you have a military elite in a strong position, but we're talking people from a very high risk profiles. You're talking Marines, and you're talking hedge fund people on the financial side. So as a profile, 
it's an interesting cabinet and on the certain level of pressure I can see them very easily escalating conflicts. So this is why I'm not buying the argument that he's going to move to the center as a result of the crisis that we see. I do believe that he'll escalate and probably if you go back and all of us are reading uh, some of his records, this is how he reacts to crisis. Uh, uh, so let's, yeah. <coughs> Thank you very much, Jacek Neider. Uh, until very <laughs> recently, I was Polish ambassador to NATO. Now I am private citizen. So, uh, from what from what you said, what is from my perspective, from the previous experience, what is most interesting? You said that the disruption of the system is not in their interest. I mean, the the Russian interest. I'm looking, I'm, I'm looking at this issue from a completely different angle because, because this is exactly from Sergei Shoigu playbook. Uh, I do agree that during the election campaign, Clinton was the main target. But then we had elections and, and Russians got a perfect president. A president who is weak, who can be easily make, uh, you can easily make uh, fun out of him. And uh, you can, uh, and so from, uh, from the very operational point of view of Russian system, uh, I would argue that this is uh, in their interest to protect him because they can influence him. And I'm really asking myself from, uh, uh, from yesterday, why they are bending him you know, out so quickly why they are b simply b making uh, his position very difficult to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to keep. Because, uh, uh, so, so last, uh, last sentence, they have a perfect president and they are so from, from the Russian perspective. But so I'm asking myself why now and what is what would be their next move, the Russian move? Because I prefer with one sentence just to be, uh, I could be wrong, and I, as I said, there are people in this room that know from time to time I have the feeling that we are slightly overvaluing the Russians' strategic positioning. Uh, at least, they, 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 they have some brilliant expertise on many things, but the, the coherence of the Russian foreign policy is also, you said why they're not doing more, what they could do at the end of the day in the United States. In a certain way, if they decide to help him, they'll hurt him. I do believe that they're much more trying to hedge on different developments they don't want to get in a bad personal relations with the idea that if he's going to be survived, and this is what everybody is doing. So now everybody is doing psychological analysis of Trump, and I do believe that Saudis are going to do the same, and everybody is going to do the same, to try to get him personally inclined. But I don't expect them to be very active on this, because he has the level of unpredictability, which is so dangerous for power, which is structurally quite weak. And also, if you see how quickly the Russians are moving to the China type of a partnership, this is not that you expect a very good relations with the US. I could be wrong, but I do believe also that they'll try now to intensify the dialogue with Europe. Because for a long period of time, they simply said, Europeans, it doesn't matter when we're going to remodel the relations with the United States. But it was the Italian, which is, of course, the preferable partner for them, but probably particularly uh, after the Macron issue and now the German elections, I'll not be surprised if they decided to talk to the Europeans and say, listen, the guy is totally unpredictable. We should try to do things uh, and we should negotiate. Because there is a Russian word, well, famous in the Russian business circles. Um, uh, and I do believe that they basically view him like this. Thank you. Um, your talk uh, was 
really impressive and interesting. Um, I just wonder whether focusing so much on Trump himself is the way forward. Um, there are people behind him who are running the, the show, and I think it's them that we should be focusing on. Um, if I understand you correctly, you're striking a uh, calming tone, and I think it's a trap. <laughs> it's a trap for foreign policy analysts, because we're happy today that the generals are responsible for the foreign and security policy, which would not normally not be the case. We wouldn't be happy that they are running the show if someone else was president. Um, so our vigilance is reduced uh, and we are, we are calmed, uh, which should maybe not be the case. Because if there's one thing that Trump may be trying to change, and I'm saying Trump in quotation marks, because you know it's not him, uh, it's the policy towards Europe. And that would be a departure from uh, 50 years of foreign policy towards Europe. If Europe is viewed as a, not as a partner, but as a competitor. Um, and I'm saying this because I think that a showdown between this party of Peter Navarro or Gary Cohn, the guys who are running the economic show, and on the other hand, uh, McMaster, uh, Jim Mattis may be in play. Uh, if economic policy is to go on a clash course with Europe, and we see that in the report from the Treasury Department from mid-April, where they blame Germany for many misdoings when it comes to the current, not to the currency, but to the economic policy. On the other hand, McMaster and, and Mattis seem to be thinking that Europe is a necessary ally. Uh, at some point, maybe there can be a clash. There will be a clash between the two camps, and I wonder who will win, who will have the upper hand. I wonder what your thoughts about this are. And there's another thing that also has to do with uh, American-European policies, and it's the divorce between values and interests. And this is what Tillerson is explicitly saying. This is what you see, for instance, in the in the coming deal in Saudi Arabia. This will be the biggest. A deal, military deal in probably in, in world's history. It's going to be $110 billion. Can you imagine? $110 billion over the, the next 10 years for Saudi Arabia to boost their military capability, including ships, airplanes, uh, self guided missiles. Um, and this was reduced at, uh, during Obama. This was stopped or limited or halted to some extent because, because of what the Saudis were doing in, in Yemen. Nowadays, there is no consideration of this sort, which is also a very bad omen for Europe. Because if values are, are not playing any role in policies, then Europe no longer needs to be a partner. Thanks. Very much, uh, because this is, first of all, I, I don't believe that, I didn't want to be calming or alarming, because I don't know enough, to be honest, uh, in order to go in one direction or the other. My, uh, and I very much agree with uh, you that uh, there is a major change, but let's make it much more clear where I stand. I do believe the change started earlier. Uh, we have the post-1989 order in the way we know it, was already in a retreat even during the previous administration. Nevertheless, it was a totally different president, very Europe friendly, because basically America started to reconsider its role in the world, because American public opinion moved away. And also, if you see the people who are basically defending a very close relations with Europe in the American high politics, this is a generation which is on its way out. Uh, I am very surprised when Europeans basically bet on people like Senator McCain, whom personally I very much respect. But listen, McCain is 80 plus. Look in the younger generation of American politicians. Somebody who is really interested, even Marco Rubio, which was basically perceived, who is coming here, who is interested. Tell me, with the exception of uh, Mr. Trump's wife, any East European anywhere closer to power. Uh, uh, and from this point of view, there's okay. Uh, I no because but because it's no no. I I, I agree and I do believe uh, personally Bannon was the most interesting for me and I didn't touch because, but I do believe it's also quite interesting because uh, we talk about military, we talk about this and that, and of course obviously there is a major clashes there. 
Uh, but it's going to be much more dependent on what is going to be the next crisis. The military now are doing fine for two reasons. They did well in Syria, so his approval rating went up, and also they are much more administratively capable fighters. Uh, if you see people who are doing Europe and Russia in the White House, and I do believe many of us know Fiona Hill, she's first class. She really knows Russia well. She's a very capable person, but she's a Russia specialist. She's not a EU person. She's one, in my view, of the best specialists that they have on Russia. But European Union was never something that she was uh, uh, very much interested in. Uh, and what is going to happen is going to be a distancing, not so much as a result of a strategic decision being taken, but because of the personal biography and profiles of the people, because of the type of the crisis coming, because of the fact that this administration wants to have victories very clearly, very, uh, uh, and also because of the fact that Europe, for the first time, uh, is facing questions. Uh, the Germans, I, I, many of you uh, followed the German debate, the very fact that there was a German debate about nuclear power. And I will not be surprised if the Germany decided to put a lot of money in strengthening the French nuclear capacity as a European nuclear capacity. Uh, I heard, I hope it was true, that even the Polish government, uh, after the elections, have been signaling to the Germans that uh, the idea of the common European army is something that they could be interested in and so on. For Europe, it's a very different uh, situation, nevertheless, of what he will do. The change already happened because change is in the mind of the policymakers. And America is not the same in our perception in the way it was before. Even if he's going to do nothing on the level of the change of policies, the perception has changed. And I do believe this is, I very much agree, this is a different situation. I don't want to calm down, but also I'm slightly afraid uh, that uh, this type of a hysterical focus on Trump covers the fact that this structural shift away from Europe did not start with this guy. Thank you very much. And fantastic to see you, Ivan, and sorry for being a couple minutes late. Um, I wanted to push back a little bit on one point you said about activist foreign policy and maybe follow up on one thing that Patrizia said. I mean, I know we are focusing on Trump, but it's, uh, it's, I, I'm just coming back from DC, and it's hard to, to overestimate how much he's isolated by the establishment, all on sides. Not only the media, Democrats, Republicans, Republicans in Congress, Republicans in his administration. So, you know, that's, it's really, we are more and more in this sort of parallel uni universe where you have US foreign policy machine doing one thing and Trump and President Trump doing his things. Of course, the system is set up in the end in such a way that American foreign policy is an advocacy process. So where you have a missing uh, center, it creates a big trouble. But just side note on this, for example, when, I, you know, when, I, when you talk with Pentagon people, they are, they are you know, about the eastern flank, everything is on autopilot, the soldiers are coming in, everything looks good. But then you push them a little bit harder and they say, well, great, but we are doing this in the absence of Russia policy. We, we don't know what the policy is. When we find out, we'll see whether we adjust or not, but we don't know what the policy is. But what I would challenge, push back a little bit on the activist foreign policy side is, there was a moment where after Syria's strikes, you know, the, the foreign policy establishment basically said, great. He's becoming presidential, the adults taking care of the, you know, taking advantage or taking, uh, uh, you know, control of the ship. Uh, it was in some way similar what media has done after the speech in Congress. Uh, and now it's over. It's, it, it, they're t it's entirely over the level of trust. And uh, if, if, so if he tries to do something, there will be a universal outcry. Now what I worry, if I had to worry about anything, is that if the crisis comes from the outside, especially domestically, big time problem. Uh, because then the power gets back into the, uh, into the Oval Office very, very clearly. One other little comment, and then I have a question about the European response. I mean, one other comment is the, you know, what you said about Orban. Uh, and overall, you can see it in many other, toward many other countries. I mean, the limit 
of ideological affinity. Uh, and, and the hopes are still out there uh, that uh, among many governments, some we know very well, that, that, that this will be something that brings, that you can do a deal because you know, you know Bannon, it's increasingly not gonna work. I mean, even if, if you can get through, uh, especially that Trump himself, he's, he's choosing among those factions. But what I wanted to ask you is, you know, is the European, the, the, mm -hmm. your assessment of how the European response can develop over time, if we indeed go in the direction of a less relevant Trump, uh, and less relevant presidency. Uh, it's all new, uh, and you know, who knows how fast this will go. Um, this is his first trip to Europe. But it, it, w what's your sense of, you know, the, the first reaction was the reaction of hedging, basically, uh, in the, you know, the, the German debate about nuclear power. Right now, this would seem quite over the top. Uh, if you look at what's going on in Washington. But I wonder what's your, what's your take on that. I do believe that in general, Europe is very risk averse. So if we are not pushed to change our policy on anything, we will not do it. So the moment, till the moment in which Trump is going directly to confront European Union with something, we'll try not to change course. And I do believe that during his trip to NATO, there are going to be many things, there are going to be He's going to warn that Article 5 was activated after 9-11. <laughs> there are going to be things happening. Uh, and I do believe that now everybody tries to domesticate him. I very much agree with you that, and from this point of view, North Korea is something that is totally different. Because American policy traditionally on nuclear was, don't ask about intentions, tell me about capacity. Because capacity shapes intentions. Uh, and from this point of view, this is a type of a policy challenge, and Obama was warning him on this, which is most difficult for any American president. How are you going to react on this? Very difficult. Uh, uh, of what, and like everybody, you go ask questions, I don't know how well we're asking, and how honestly they're answering, but part of the problem with people like Matisse and McMaster and so on, they were in a disagreement with Obama, not on his general assessment about the world, but about the fact that any mo at any moment when inaction was an option, this is going to be the preferable option. And they wanted basically activism because they were afraid that this kind of a very strong bias for inaction creates problem for the credibility of the American power. Some of these people has a very strong personal views on Iran. General Mattis was one of the Marine commanders who was in Lebanon uh, when the American uh, uh, Marines were killed by Hezbollah. And because I was in Stanford, he spent a year in Stanford before going there. People said, after some drink, he's always say, they killed my boys. So from this point of view, I do believe Iran is a critical issue. This is why the Russian uh, uh, American cooperation in Syria is going to be very difficult because Russians, and this is also about the Russians, nevertheless of what they want. Russians are in the air, Iranians on the ground, his boys on the ground. Russians cannot challenge really the Iranians in Syria even if they want to make a deal with the Americans because they're not on the ground. Or oh, they're in the ground in one place, which probably for, of those of you who are not following, there is a Chechen battalion in Aleppo. Russians sent special only of Chechen's battalion in Aleppo to play kind of a <laughs> policing between different communities. But it's a highly risk policy. Russia is positioning itself as a Muslim power. Uh, and and th this is, uh, so from this point of view, I do believe that uh, Everybody has so much constraints. Uh, there was a talk, and I know that uh, the private citizen who talked before knows much more than me. Uh, Americans are now going to push very strongly in May that NATO become officially part of uh, the coalition in Syria. And the Germans and French are not highly enthusiastic. Uh, and I do believe this, all this type of things, who is going to press on what and so on, is going to do it, and uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, but since we have two levels of the discussion, first is uh, uh, talking about policies. 
this is complicated enough, but uh, this is somehow the normal business. But the other level is, of course, much more challenging because it's the level of the debate on the system, of the future of the system, the framework. What is the frame, framework within which we are trying to solve, to address the, the problems? And I agree with you that the changes uh, began earlier. Uh, it's not, Trump is not uh, the cause of the, of the changes. So the question is, um, is he just an accelerator of the changes, or is he a, a sort of disruptive moment that um, cannot be reversed? Mm, uh, uh, I think this is the, that's the key question. Um, he is not trying to, to change, to reform the policies within the system. He. I don't know whether he has an ambition to destroy the system, because that uh, would require a sort of a systemic approach, which um, uh, seems not to be his way of thinking. But he has uh, certainly no idea of the system, and he uh, does not understand the system. You, you started with a sort of psychological analysis of, uh, of his personality. and. Um, I, I totally agree. This is someone who just does not understand. He's, he does not see himself as part of the, of the system, unlike his predecessors. But, uh, the predecessors, of course, had uh, uh, differing priorities, but they were part of the same system. And now, for the first time, we have a president who is not part of the system. And this is, of course, uh, a disruptive moment for everybody, and we don't know what to do. Should we now? Some people are saying we should isolate him, or um, the U.S. establishment will isolate him. I don't believe that it is going to work uh, uh, as simply. Um, I, I just was in Berlin. Uh, my impression was where the Germans are begging uh, um, uh, that the Americans uh, uh, beggingly trying to find uh, anchors of hope. In, in Washington, and suddenly uh, saying, well, we have to think strategically. We have not been strategic enough. And this is why the Americans uh, simply do not take us seriously. In order to be taken serious, seriously, we need to think strategically. If we think strategically, then maybe the Americans will need us as a, as a partner. And that's the message to, to the, to the um, uh, people surrounding uh, Trump, not to Trump uh, himself. Uh, the German Minister of Foreign Affairs says, well, we cannot just um, stop the, nego the nego negotiating process with Turkey, because uh, for we need Turkey for strategic reasons. And saying that we have to negotiate a membership with Turkey for strategic reasons, this is something really sensational. <laughs> Imagine. Uh, for a Western leader would have said something like that five years ago. There was a catalogue. Uh, they do not fulfill the uh, criteria. Okay, come on. Um, let's stop it. Um, so people feel that um, Europe has to make adjustments. The question is, is it too late or isn't it too late? Can Europe make itself attractive enough to the U.S. in order to try to restore uh, the transatlantic uh, relationship. It seems to me that this is a little bit like some of uh, the 1968 generation and the capitalism, <coughs> fighting capitalism but not going to give it up. Um, you need uh, the enemy that you criticize. And suddenly, when people realize they may lose the enemy, that they love uh, to criticize. And then they say, no, no, we don't want to lose uh, this enemy. We need this enemy. And now they even uh, start talking about the enemy as a, as a friend. Um, what I, last um, sentence, what I do not understand anything uh, about is the behavior of friends in this game. How will France position itself in this game. I understand that France will try to um, 
to uh, restore a privileged relationship with Germany at the expense of the transatlantic relationship or in order to uh, strengthen uh, the European Union as a partner of the US. And on France, probably Alec is going to say more, but there are two things that for me is very important. One is all this talk that Germany can replace the United States as the leader of the liberal order. This reminds me, if you remember, during the Gorbachev time, there was a people who believed that Eric Honecker can basically stabilize the true communist system. It's also the problem of capacity. It's not, and I have a huge respect for Germany. This is not, for me, a serious conversation on the European side. Uh, but uh, Trump has, in my view, touch on something, and this is this value question, that is quite important, and we should be honest about this, and probably there is something in it. His attack is that the American ideology of being liberal power with open borders, migration nation, and so on, in the current moment of globalization, is against America's interest. Because it forbids America to do things which other can easily do, for example, like building walls. And he goes to the American public and talks this. So from this point of view, he's pushing a, not a foreign policy consensus, but the basic consensus. Secondly, he said, we like so much to talk about our democratic government, but our democratic government is now transformed in a total level of paralyzed, dysfunctional system in which decision cannot be taken. I was uh, seeing very interesting data about uh, where kind of a demand for more authoritarian uh, uh, solutions are coming in the United States. And do you know what? They're not coming from the far left and they're not coming from the far right. This is the center, who is so much pissed off with the level of polarization in the American politics that the decision is not taken, that nothing is done. And this was this type of a group of people that at the last moment made it for Trump. Uh, so from this point of view, he's much more challenging the system. I don't know. He does not have an idea how to replace it. So going on a value conversation with the United States from this point of view is not an option. Because he blames the previous governments that their value talk made America vulnerable. How to have a strategic talk with Trump is also not easy because the colleagues were saying he's not this type of a Nixonian realpolitik person. He's not playing crazy. He probably is. Uh, and from this point of view, this is a very difficult. Uh, uh, I'm using him metaphorically, but uh, and here comes the, the problem of Germany and France. And part of this is called Poland, honestly speaking. Because Germany used to have a very important policy with respect to Russia. And we know very well in talking, but this was their Polish policy. It was based on a very special strategic relationship with Poland. At the moment when Central European countries, basically God knows where they are on many other issues, the instinct is, the, the instinct is that consolidating Eurozone, and France is not interested very much in Central and Eastern Europe, focusing not simply on the German French, but consolidating Eurozone, putting all the political energy on reforming Eurozone, coming with a minister for the Eurozone, with the budget for the Eurozone, in a kind of a pre-enlargement focus. Germans were never going to do it in a situation with a very active Poland, because economically Poland is, and Poland is big, so this is not Bulgaria, it's not Hungary. So I do believe in a strange way it's going to be also up to the Polish government to decide in this game what they want. Thank you. Daniel Rothfeld. Well, I, I would like to say that I, in fact, I, I do agree with you, Ivan, in your assessment, evaluation of Russia that, in fact, it is overestimated in general in this country. And Russia is much more aware about its weaknesses and uh, motivated to great extent by the inferiority complex. And as far as the uh, external partners, the United States was and is the main point of reference. And uh, the fundamental change in American-Russian relations for Putin was uh, when uh, Obama proclaimed uh, the, the, the uh, concept of exclusiveness of the United States, that Americans are exclusive. And he said, we are exclusive as well. In other words, for them, a kind of the pattern of the 
uh, Russia's position in the world is uh, the United States. On the other hand, they did not find, I would say, the possibility, and you are absolutely right, it is not uh, generated now in, or in the period of Obama, it is since many years. In fact, it is a kind of the element of continuity. Uh, I, I'm not going to say uh, too many words about why Russia is weak economically, it is weak as a state, very bad organization, and they do not, they, they are using the, some words, but they do not understand the meaning of the words. For example, modernization. They are speaking a lot about modernization, and then they stopped, I would say, to, to discuss modernization because they know that, in fact, it is uh, in Russia a kind of the uh, uh, underdevelopment which is much stronger just to say that uh, they are much more dependent at the moment on China than, uh, in fact, uh, many people are able, I would say, to to realize, not only in Russia, but also outside of Russia. And when somebody is seeing, uh, it, it seems to me that it was Patricia who mentioned here that it is the biggest uh, deal now in Saudi Arabia, 100 billions. In fact, uh, China is going to pay 124 billions for constructing this new line of, uh, uh, of interconnection with Europe. It is, I would say, to a great extent motivated, in, in fact, a kind of the counterbalance uh, to the United States in China. But uh, on the other hand, as far as uh, uh, Donald Trump is concerned, I would like to say that, in my view, uh, he has priority. A priority is Donald Trump. In other words, he is very, uh, uh, very much oriented on his own personal position. Uh, Janusz Reiter just said that he does not understand what does it mean system. I do agree with you that he does not understand not only what does it mean system. For him it is not interesting. He is, con he is considering that all these notions, they, uh, they are uh, meaningless. In fact, it is the problem that uh, America first and uh, America should be great again. In other words, some slogans. And uh, he's motivated in, I would like not to, to, to be uh, 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 very trivial, but in, in fact, my intention is to say that it is a problem that people cannot find the common language with him because he's very unusual in the sense that he's not competent. And the language uh, is very important, I would say, in the politics. I, in a sense, I would like to say that I do agree that, uh, in fact, what made in the past, America's policy uh, um, different and uh, very interesting that it was a kind of the combination of three elements, uh, interest, potential, and values. And now values do not play a role. In other words, it is only potential uh, and uh, interest. But uh, my, my question is, is connected with uh, the problem that at the moment we, we have in the world uh, three, four uh, very uh, vulnerable points. I have in mind, I would say, uh, um, Korean Peninsula, and you rightly said that, if, in fact, the strength of the North Korea is not because it is strong, but it is uh, exactly weakness, is the strength of the North Korea because uh, uh, the leader of North Korea, he is oriented and motivated mainly how to protect his own governance and his own position. In other words, it is not, a, uh, his intention is not to protect, I would say, uh, a kind of the system or to protect uh, uh, the Korean people in opposite. It is, I would say, for him, he knows, and they knew, especially after what happened in, in the rest of the world, that in case of the change of the system, it will be the end of, of uh, the, all those uh, people of nomenclatura and uh, himself. In other words, they played the role that every four years, in fact, it is, I would say, a very Asian approach that every four years, they produce a kind of the generated crisis. And always, I would say, the West, together with China and Russia, paid 
paid off, and uh, after the next four years, once again, that it was with uh, William Perry, and later on, I would say it was, uh, by the way, Madeleine Albright and the others, they wanted to do the same, including Carter. Altogether, I would say uh, it is a very specific, I would say, problem. My question is one connected with uh, Korea. Second, you mentioned Iran. It seems to me that the situation is quite different because Iran is uh, highly developed. Uh, the, the politics and politicians are uh, very, very ideologized. In, in fact, it is motivated by ideology to a much greater extent than uh, in many other parts of the world. But on the other hand, Iran should be seen in a totally different way than many uh, other countries. And the last point as far as relations between uh, the United States and the European Union is concerned, it seems to me that uh, Donald Trump contributed to a much greater extent in consolidation of the Europe. In other words, he could be a kind of the uh, uh, driving force for the reintegration of Europe, smaller but stronger because I would say Europe cannot rely on the United States. I, I'm saying this with an intention to know what you are thinking about, because in my view, Europe has now a chance to be reintegrated and to be much, much more responsible. Uh, by the way, as far as uh, Germany is concerned, it, it seems to me that Germany could be a leader of Europe, but uh, the leader for fair weather. We need somebody who is for all type of weather, not only for fair fair weather, but also uh, in a situation as it is now very risky and critical. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Because what you said, there is one point that I very much wanted to make, and I'm sorry that I didn't. Uh, because the pro part of the problem with the Trump's coming is also the technological change that come. And uh, th this is not by accident that you have all this hysteria around disruptions, hacking, and so on. It, for me, makes sense to compare the nuclear and the cyber in order to see what is the major story of the world where you have the mutually assured destruction and where you have a mutually assured disruption. Why? The nuclear was a weapon that was created in order not to be used. It was owned by very few and it was very clear when you are using it basically no deniability of who did it. Uh, it can destroy everything. Here you have with the cyber something that is created in order to be used many times, limited impact, much more disrupting, very high level of uh, deniability. You can suspect who did it, not easy to prove who did it. And in my view, what is also coming is the non-state actor phenomenon, which is becoming critically important. Uh, so now there is much more information about how the Russian system on the cyber works. And this is quite interesting, because one of the things that happened is uh, the hackers were very popular in Russia for totally different reason. Uh, before hacking Hillary Clinton, they were hacking business people with their bank accounts in order to blackmail for money. Uh, when this kind of hackers were got, they were mobilized by the intelligence officers, and they start to share some of the profits, and they were protecting them by giving them patriotic duties. Uh, in a certain way, you're hacking for the state in order to be able also to hack for private gain. So as a result of it, you create a community of people which on one level, of course, is staged and directed from above, but on the other, started to have a power of their own. And talking about the risk scenarios, here's a risk scenario which uh, basically was haunting me when I was in Stanford. Stanford is a very much anti-Trump place. You have all these young people who, in my view, slightly even are overreacting to what is happening. For them, this is the end of the world. They're personally kind of hurt by the fact that he was elected. And reading the papers, which they trust, they know that it was the Russians who elected them because of their cyber capabilities. Some of these young people are very able on the cyber stuff. This is why they're there. Are you going to be surprised if some of them are going basically to punish the Russians for what they did to them? And how the Russians will know that this is not the American state, but it is the Stanford University students? 
And on the other side, and this was very clear, uh, when there was a lot of people who said on the level of forensic, there was almost clear that the Russians were behind uh, Macron attack. But Macron attack, if you don't believe it is for the parliamentary elections, does not make much more political sense. So we ended up in a situation in which, because of the technological change, we had such a high risk perceptions. We feel so insecure because the problem is that people want to return the borders. 1989 changed the meaning of the borders. They didn't change so much the borders with the exception of the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia. But the, the idea was we are going to have a hard budget and soft borders and this is how the world is going to function. Now people want to restore the borders. You build walls to stop foreigners. You go with protectionist policies, you know, the basically to control trade. The border that is most difficult to restore is the information border. And I'm afraid that now we are going to move in a situation in which the globalization, the infrastructure of the globalization is going to be destroyed. Uh, I know that some people are very much acclaiming Ukrainians for taking the decision uh, to shut down contact and so on. Listen, the next stage is going to be the Russians are going to close Facebook. And the next stage is going to be that basically you're going to have a nationalization uh, of the internet on the bait of the big communities, which means that all the talk about uh, globalization is going to be totally different. And the problem is that Trump is an agent of disruption, but in an age of disruption. And this is why he's so kind of also threatening, because the technological change itself uh, make the world much more unpredictable. So he simply basically became the face of unpredictability, which was very much there. Because if you see how we talk about certain things, uh, the, the fears that we developed about certain things, this is, in my view, a very important expression of the fact that the level of uncertainty cannot be reduced, that uh, the policy chaos coming from Washington. It's much more structural in its nature. Vojimir Simosevic, bardzo proszę. I think that uh, there is at least one more area when, uh, where it is possible to look for some hints, uh, probably making it a little bit easier to imagine what may happen to Trump, uh, and it is the past, his past. Uh, one can say that if there was uh, anything really compromising, Democrats would find it and uh, show it to the people. I am not sure of that, personally. And. Um, now, my question to you is, uh, is uh, what do you think, uh, uh, what, what may be the possible impact uh, of uh, discovering, in my opinion, almost certain discovering skeletons in Trump's wardrobe? One of the examples, uh, at least I received that uh, that way, was uh, Flynn's scandal, and uh, a consequence of it, uh, in that kind of unexpected sensational statement by Spicer, that Trump wants Russia to withdraw from Crimea and Eastern Ukraine. I think that in that moment in time, nobody expected that kind of demand. I think that that was uh, an attempt to stop the fire, which potentially could move towards White House. Uh, so um, uh, that kind of situations uh, may, if I'm right in my assessment, uh, result in major decisions in, uh, uh, in doing something um, absolutely unexpected from the guy. And of course may have uh, direct impact on his personal faith and political faith. Very much, and uh, I, uh, one of the interesting story on the base of what we know and we shock me is, you have a very senior American intelligence general like Mike Flynn which is doing things which are ridiculous even for a low-level Bulgarian intelligence officer. Uh, I mean, he goes to Moscow and giving a big honorarium. He makes a deal with the Turks about the, which shows you that there is certain problem in the system. I do believe that the loyalty is the, I don't it's, I do believe very similar on the Russian case, but loyalty is the value number one in the Trump system. And loyalty means you're going to defend me when I'm wrong. If I'm right and you defend me, it does not have value. Uh, 
The value is you are defending me when I'm totally wrong. I don't believe very much in the idea of Trump being blackmailed because the paradoxical problem with people like Trump is that he has so much kind of skeletons that he does not care about it. I'm sure that something is going to come on Manfort. It should, basically. He was moving in such of a circles that it cannot. It's going to come on Flint. But the problem is that American society is so polarized that I'm afraid, and you know this from Poland, and I, they're going to be a clash of conspiracy theories. Uh, the, the media space, and this is one of the things I, I was reading, a very impressive analysis, why the Macron leaks basically has no impact in France, and why they had a very important in, uh, in the United States. 50% of the most discussed, <coughs> trended, tweeted issues on the American uh, media space are created outside of the mainstream media. And when I say mainstream media, it means both left and right. You have a parallel media reality. In France, it's only 20%. In a certain way, the mainstream media in France is dominating the agenda. As a result of it, anything that they're going to discover in the Braid Brat world is going to be basically told as a conspiracy against Trump. They're going to be something else. So you're going to have a total clash, not of ideologies anymore, but of conspiracy theories. Because if you have, if political person has an ideological identity, he can remain, for example, conservative or leftist and being critical to his own community. If you are just subscribing for conspiracy theory, you're either in or out. And I'm afraid that the, the nature of the fragmentation of the American political space, unlike in the Nixon period, makes much more difficult to have the impeachment moment which is endorsed by a kind of a general public, where people know that certain line was crossed, that this is not the way it works. It's going to be perceived the elite trying to punish the outsider who came and tried to threaten their power. And if you see how basically they're reacting to any type of a news coming, this is exactly this way. And uh, talking about these technological changes, in my view, probably this is the most important thing that happened. The government, the mainstream media, the elite, is not creating the information on the base of which people are understanding what is happening in their own societies, many people. Thank you very much. Lukasiewicz. I know. Thank you very much. And, uh, Trump idea is to make America great again, I would say. Putin idea is to make Russia great again. China is already great again. And of course, there are a lot of reasons for competition between great powers. But it seems to me that there are also some strong incentives for cooperation of great powers. And my question is, to what extent do you expect that this kind of cooperation, especially advice, I, I presume, by Kissinger can be undertaken. And, and in what fields? And what could be the results? Because the, the, the visit of the, of the president of China so soon, and talks with Russia, uh, even before, I would say, elections, can indicate not only for competition, but also could indicate and uh, that, that there are some strong considerations about cooperation. Thank you very much. And this is a great uh, uh, story because many people in the foreign policy community in the U.S., particularly because of Kissinger, were trying to read the Russia policy as uh, the China policy of the 1970s reversed. And it made a lot of logical sense. The problem with the Kissinger position is that he's advising the president both on Russia and China. Uh, he had a very well established relations with, uh, with the Chinese. And I do believe that from this point of view it's interesting, because for Europe it's going to be an interesting story. I do believe that if one belt when road starts to develop, the major problem for Europe is going to be to what extent the idea of a greater Eurasia is not going to be something that Europe should discuss. And here, basically, it's not about the relations of EU with Russia, but it's much more about China, Russia, and the EU. Uh, 
Chinese, from this point of view, are very much, in my view, benefiting from the type of the crisis and a totally Russia-centric talk, uh, both in Europe and the United States. Uh, President Trump, I don't know on which advice, came with this uh, Taiwan telephone talk. Uh, and then basically the Chinese has communicated that if he's not going to declare that he stays for the one China policy, they're not going to have any relations with the new administration. And he blinked. And this is part of the problem with the Trump position. Trump position tried to show himself as a strong leader, ready for very risky actions, unlike the previous president who basically was very risk averse. The problem with this position is that somebody can decide to basically change test your bluff. Uh, and the Chinese did it. Uh, and if you see, uh, I do believe it's great that he's changing his China policy and talking to the Taiwanese Prime Minister, I don't believe it was the most genius things ever. But it means that now they're going much more to lead policy. The relations with Russia is becoming so much domestic policy. Listen, some of the things that Trump is saying about the Russia make sense. If you if there is somebody with whom they should talk about Syria, for sure it's much more the Russians than the, Syri than the Iranians, because the Russians are much more easy, basically, to withdraw from Assad than the Syrians are. So uh, the story is that now, because of what he is, because of the nature of the electoral victory, no serious analytical talk about Russian-American relations is possible in the United States. And I, I fear this. China is slightly, and do you know why it is so this? Because there is no economic relations between Russia and the US. As a result of it, you do not have any kind of a serious business lobby for normalization. If you want to be a radical in the United States, the easiest to be on is Russia, because symbolically very high, on the business level, zero. So this is symbolic politics. China is very much related to the American economy. Uh, the Obama people, if they felt very badly about something, it was TPP, because for them it was a strategic initiative, it was not a trade initiative. Uh, how good it was isolating China, we also don't know. Uh, but my idea is that he's not going, Kissinger is very much a person who starts with the fact that you have a long-term policy, he's about the grand games. I cannot see Trump as any grand game, for good or bad. He's much more short-term, he's much more reactive, and also he's very much claiming victory. If you want to play Kissingerian games, you should claim basically defeat when you are winning in order to make this easier for the other side. I don't have the feeling that Trump is ready to give the other side something. It's interesting, for example, how is going to be his talk in Saudi Arabia, because big money a big money, but he should talk something about Islam. And I was just reading today the survey, 84% of the Saudis believes that he is strongly anti-Islam anti and so on. So it's, it's also words, it's also tweets. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Krasa, for a really fantastic uh, speech. Um, I'm former ambassador to Afghanistan, and uh, I have a question regarding those small countries, also stepping back from the global politics, China, Russia, but going back to Syria and Afghanistan. But you said very rightly that if the president, the U.S. president is being swamped, is being, you know, having troubles at home, he goes outside. Small wars are always a favorable weapon of choice. Um, but my question would be not about Trump and his willingness to produce a coalition in Syria or, or, or strengthening the forces in Afghanistan, for, for instance. But my question would be about the, what's your analysis of the willingness of the small countries like Poland, Bulgaria, Romania, to going back into the situation from 2003 where we joined United States in Iraq because of our, our relation vis-a-vis -vis United States and, you know, kind of a, um, uh, not going in, with, within the mainstream of European Union. So is this, is this situation from back then can be repeated right now? If, if for, for instance, if, Trump's, if, Trump, if, if Donald Trump thinks about the grand coalition in Syria against, against Daesh, do you think that there is a willingness or, or there is appetite in, in the small countries, in the, in, the Eastern, in, in the Eastern Europe countries, for repeating that, um, that kind of experience. 
Thank you. Can you say only about Bulgaria? No. Uh, in a certain way, uh, uh, part of what we see is also the result of 2003. Uh, uh, Bulgaria, the position of our government, and I do believe in many respects we have a very common sense government, Borisov from this point of view is a person, is first, we now, unlike in 2003, have a real security concern. For Bulgaria, what is the relations with Turkey of primary importance. Bulgaria simply cannot resist if they are going to be a major flow of people coming on the Turkish-Bulgarian border, this is going to basically disrupt the system in a big way. So from this point of view, we're very careful. The position of our prime minister is America cannot help you, America can hurt you. So from this point of view, I don't see any of our countries going on a policy which is attacking the United States, developing kind of an anti-American sentiment. Probably it's going to be different for Baltics, for Poland, because of the strategic stories. But listen, uh, let's give you some data which probably uh, uh, you know. There was a study being done, global studies, with the following question. If your country today is going to have a major security threat, which is the country you're going to turn for help? And you should give one country. The majority of the Bulgarians are turning to Russia. The majority of the Greeks are turning to Russia. The majority of the Serbs are turning to Russia. There are more Turks that are turning to Russia than to the United States. Uh, particularly with these unpopular elites and weak governments, I do believe public opinion is going to play more and more role in the way the countries are going to position themselves on the foreign policy issues. Nobody is going to risk to do anything which is strongly resisted by public opinion because simply, unlike in 2003, the political capital that was there then for the governments is not there. So I'll be surprised. I, I cannot see Bulgarian troops in Syria under any scenario. In Afghanistan, they have been there because people didn't know about this. We, don't, we didn't cover Afghanistan. This was an entirely right decision of the government because there is no support. So I don't know how it's here. Uh, I, I can't imagine that Poland can be different, but Bulgaria, I don't see this. Yes, thank you, Ivan. Uh, I have a quick question for you, and, and this is obviously about uh, uh, the president uh, somehow indirectly, um, but it's about uh, you know more speculation. You've talked about perceptions uh, that are so ma so important that yeah, we sort of in Europe think America is no longer. Uh, America we used to know and, and this kind of stuff and uh, and I understand that you are not um, an advocate of the view that impeachment may be you know any year soon at this time but uh, if, if we wanted to speculate a bit about the others not the president you know having seen the sort of the very messy um, um, landscapes unfolding over the last few days in, in Washington um, to what extent do you think that durability of this president has already become an issue a policy issue in major places we're talking about. And uh, to what uh, uh, extent it may play a role already in the policy calculations? I mean, in other words, I mean, would you think that there are already those for whom we are already in the kind of a time of interregnum huh? in policy terms? Thank you very much. L l let's stay with I, I was after the elections in the Washington, and what struck me, it so much reminded me of Bulgaria in 1990. But the elite was simply in the position of the ex-communist party. Uh, they know everything, they have the capacity, but on the other side they have the feeling that they don't know what is happening in the country. Uh, they basically all the time are very much uh, struck by the lack of competence, because Bulgaria and Poland was slightly different on this. We came from the street, we really didn't know much uh, of what was going on. Uh, I do believe that one of the things that is very important for any democracy is the level of conformism of the elites. People that two months ago were telling me, I cannot work in the Trump administration, ever. Two months later, they said, listen, in this situation, the best what I can do for my country is to join the administration. The problem is, are they going to invite me? Uh, so I do believe that in order for Trump, and I do believe that there is a major story, and there are many people who, both Republicans and the Democrats, who cannot tolerate this situation, unless he starts to lose support among the Republican voters, not the general public. 
nothing much is going to change because the American system is so much organized around one party counties, constituencies. If you see f 50 years ago, 50% uh, of the Americans were living in a counties in which one or the other party can win the elections. Now 70% of the Americans lives in a regions in which one of the parties winning with more than 20%. So from this point of view, you have so much one party constituencies in which it's going to be a Republican. And the fear that he can run against you another Republican if you're going to oppose you is very, very, in my view, uh, risky for the Congress. Senate is different. First, because it's a bigger place. Second, because there are people who are not running for re-elections. But in my view, people like Lindsey Graham and uh, McCain, they're not as influential as we see them exactly because of the fact that they're out of the electoral politics. For these people, what Trump is doing is just destroying the legacy of all their years. Listen. And also there is a lot of personal, I do remember all of you follow, when somebody like Trump sent for John McCain that he's a coward because he allowed to be captured during the war. By the way, then I understood how much I don't understand anything. I was sure that this is going to destroy him because the guy who declared that he spent the Vietnam years much more in the sexual wars, going to a war hero and telling him that you are nobody because you're allowed to be captured. It, it, it doesn't matter. And from this point of view, I do believe in order to have an impeachment moment, not simply in legal terms and political, something should happen on the level of the republic. If he starts losing support, if his support among the republicans go under 60, this is a different game. And then people are going to distance. This is like, do you remember the famous moment in the campaign when came this video about women and so on and so on? Your first push is to say, I want to distance. But the second is to look at your <laughs> constituency and to say how much I can lose. So from this point of view, I'll be surprised, honestly speaking. Are there any other c questions? One more question, because you follow up on what you said, that many people who said previously they will never serve under Trump uh, are eager to do so. But on the other hand, this is like the most porous uh, White House ever. Like the leaks are constant. Uh, and uh, quite often they even come from the president himself as during uh, uh, the meeting with Wavrov probably. So my, my question is, we said that when the president have troubles at home, he moves uh, towards foreign policy. He needs some success in foreign policy uh, or in military action. But when you have a, a president like that and a White House like that, that cannot keep a secret because they will lick it either to the press or uh, to, to, to foreign countries, can you actually do that? Can you have any success in foreign policy? Can you have any campaign? You said before that Trump is incapable of this kind of Kissingerian thinking in the long run, but even short term, uh, success because you know bombing Syria can work once but it it cannot be your regular policy every time you have trouble at home you're gonna bomb this country or another it's it, 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 it won't so many countries in the world. <laughs> it's not gonna work I, I guess so maybe I'm wrong so my question is if you have this trouble with your own administration and you have other problems at home can you actually move towards foreign policy and have any success in it he, I don't believe that he's interested in a major military clash. And don't forget, one of the reasons he was elected was that Hillary Clinton was perceived as extremely hawkish, somebody who is just looking for a place to invade, and he was perceived as a guy who wants to stay home. Uh, and people like Bannon didn't like the fact. They said, you promised the American people to make America great again and not to go outside. So this clash is going to be there, but on the other side, what the Republicans are telling him, let's have the big tax reform, because this is the other story. Not easy, because for this you need the Senate. And the Senate, there are people in the Senate who really hate him. So it's even not how good or bad his plan is, there are people who hate him. The problem is that you are acting in areas in which the presidential powers are strongest and very much the decision depends on you. And there are two areas like this. This is 
foreign policy and military policy, and the other is the trade policy, strangely enough. Uh, so from this point of view, he will act not on anything else, but where you can have unilateral decision, where you don't need the Congress and where you don't need the Senate, because he needs a victory for himself. What victory means, listen, what happened in Syria, we don't see any major strategic uh, consequences of it. So from this point of view, saying it was not a real victory, I agree with you. But from the point of view of changing the image, if he was not doing other things, this could have been a turning point for him. He started to be perceived as presidential. Uh, I do believe he'll turn very much against the people who attacked him. Uh, 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 at least uh, in this moment, what you're doing, you're polarizing as much as possible. You're trying to make us versus them. It's going to be a civil war. And from this point of view, if I was the Russians, I can only enjoy it. Because uh, what is happening is the very credibility of the America as the global ruler is very much damaged. Uh, it's, it's not serious in a way. Uh, just to end, because on a very funny story, one of the interesting effects is the Trump effect that has nothing to do with Trump. But how different people imagine Trump. Uh, a, a Trump club was created in Bulgaria just after the elections. It was created by the last head of the political police in Bulgaria and the several kind of the most pro-Russian forces because for Trump it was kind of really the Moscow candidate. In places like Macedonia, one of the reasons the Prime Minister Gruevsky decided to take such a tough course was that he believes that Trump means such a radical change of the American foreign policy. Uh, part of the lack of a political identity on the Trump side is that many people can use it very creatively for their own purposes. You cannot blame Trump for this American policy on the Balkans did not change with Trump at all. Uh, but it changed the dynamic on the ground because there are people who said, no, everything is going to be different. He's going to do this. He's going to do that. And I do believe this is the least analyzed impact because this is the Trump by the way, very strong impact on the far-right parties. He hurt them because they decided to imitate them. I saw this in Austria. Uh, the Austrian uh, 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 far-right, which is going to enter the government after next elections, they were moving to the center. They had a high level of acceptability because then for a long time there. And if they had been slightly more quiet, they could have won the presidential elections. But after the Trump victory on the last round, they decided to show new radicalism because they wanted to imitate him. And the publics in Europe were not ready for this. And I do believe Marie Le Pen, Marine Le Pen also basically, she went so much more born again radical after Trump's effect. So the Trump effect works in different directions. Uh, yeah, it's also managed to scare certain publics. Uh, it's misfired in the case of Orban, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, this is true, but especially in the case of the uh, extremist parties, that people were scared by their new uh, the atmosphere of self-assurance and conviction that they that they will win. A few words about France. We will finish it, but there were some uh, there were some question posed. As concerned foreign policy, this is quite interesting that the minister of foreign policy is called. Minister of Europe and International Relations. So it shows already uh, priorities. And uh, uh, about Europe, uh, uh, Macron was saying a lot, but about uh, other relations, not too much. But, however, he was the only among candidates, both left and right, who was for the maintaining of sanctions against Russia, which meant, in the same time, although he was not saying too much, also fidelity towards NATO, and it says something indirectly about attitudes about the United States. Actually, all those who were for the elimination of sanction and better relation with Russia, and most of them, they were automatically, implicitly anti-American. This is traditional French from Richelieu times sort of geopolitical game. So from this point of view, he is very traditional uh, geopoliticians, but we, we know nothing. Uh, he's interested interested in, in Europe, and, and I think that we will know in a few months what will be the impact of France. It will depend uh, to a very big extent upon the success of 
during the summer here, introduction of some major social and economic reforms. This is the major test. What will be first, whether he will win or not the parliamentary election soon, and afterwards, what will be the reaction of trade unions and, uh, let's say, people, people on the street. If he is capable to show to Germany, besides other things, he is capable to, uh, to reform French economy, I think that his position vis-a-vis -vis Germany will be reinforced, and also the importance of his vision of Europe around, around Eurozone. Uh, the, the, the second, what, what you said, Ivan, ab about the fa fake news, why in France it, the impact was much more limited, which is, which is quite, quite interesting. I think the first, because French knew already the example of the United States, and there was a lot of talk about the possible impact of, of, of Russia. So when there were practically around two subjects, uh, uh, fake news about his uh, homosexuality, deduction from the fact that he's married to the, uh, his ex-teacher, ex 24 years older, and the second about his, also without any proof, about, about, about money. And also what was very important, he answered, he had prepared answer in a very, in a very brilliant way. He, so so um, now, uh, now uh, you have still three minutes before, before 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 leaving us. You know, he changed not only attitudes towards China, he changed attitudes towards almost every dossier about, about Russia, about European Union, about Israel and Middle East. So in the same time, I'm not sure whether you are right that there is no any strategy because his strategy from the very beginning, although I'm not sure, I, I'm even, I don't think he's capable to, uh, to realize it. This is, uh, this is uh, uh, the economy first, and not to play a role of the policeman who is paying, uh, let's say, um, everybody is free rider. This is against free riders, who are as a free rider. Uh, so th this is the, this is this fundamental his, his strategy, or what he is capable to achieve. This is only negative attitudes of, of, of his position, because you 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 see the destabilization of the uh, of the attitudes towards the United States uh, and Europe turning more to to China, um, and quite possible if you are right that Russia will turn towards Europe. Uh, I cannot exclude that Europe will turn towards, towards Russia. So the, this is uh, quite par paradoxical effects of, 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 his, of his policy. You have one minute and a half even to answer. Let, let's, and, yeah, let's tell you where it. was my uh, yeah. biggest kind of a, uh, Trump story. When he asked for one billion from South Korea about the missile system, you have two readings which are very different. One is very strategic, Kissingerian. Chinese were very unhappy with this radar. So probably he has made a deal with China at the cost of China pressing on North Korea. So you can see it as a policy. You can like it or dislike it. But it is part of a much bigger strategic constellation. On the other side, he really simply wants one billion. Uh, and when McMaster said no, 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 the basic problem is that we are not prepared, I am not prepared, probably you are, to treat American president as somebody who is making accidental statements. We always, because of the huge power that they have, we try to believe that there is always something behind it, policy. Good or bad, it doesn't matter, but policy. And the problem is the guys that, in many cases, he's just talking. Uh, and, and you don't know, and this is, in my view, making the analysis very difficult because in one case, it is a policy. You can agree or disagree, but you discuss policy. In the second one, it is... Razgavorczyk. <laughs> <laughs>